So thank you so much everybody for joining today for our Builder Workshop. So we are going to be covering today our, our latest functionality around API management. So we've got an exciting session here to take you through this new feature set, hopefully give you some ideas about how this can be used. Um, and again, just take, taking the time to thank you for, for jumping on. So in terms of the agenda for the session, I'm going to start with a quick introduction and take a look at what is Trey's API management. We'll take a look at when we or one some of the ways in which you can use API management. We'll take you through some use cases so you can get an idea of some areas in which you might be able to leverage this. I'll then hand over to Joshua, who will take you through a demo of this feature so you can actually see it live in action on the platform. And then we'll finish up with a portion from Tom from our product side to give you a product spotlight and a roadmap overview and give you a chance at the end for a Q&A portion. So if anything crops up as we are going through any of the content here today, feel free to pop that into the Q&A portion and we'll make sure that we get to that towards the end as well. So let's dive in. As a quick refresher for I'm sure a lot of you or for some new information for anybody not familiar. So one of the big things here at Trey is with our Trey Universal Automation Cloud, we have three main experiences across the platform that you have access to. So the first one is what we refer to as Trey Build. And that's the idea of providing you with those integrations and automations built out with our low code workflow builder. We then can take that a step further with Trey Code, which has given you a lot of developer-centric tools that allow you to unlock a lot of interesting use cases within that developer space. And then finally, what we refer to as Trey Chat, which is that natural language interface that allows you to interact with the platform in that natural language manner. So when we look specifically at the feature that we're here to discuss today around API management, it does fit really nicely into this tray build space, purely because a lot of what you're going to be doing with API management is taking some of those underlying workflows that you've built with tray code using that low code builder and exposing that fundamentally as an API endpoint. So, of course, a really good starting point is, you know, covering what is Trace API management. And so the general idea here is that it's providing you with a powerful and simple method of creating API endpoints that can be accessed both internally and externally. So generally what's going to happen is it's going to enable you to expose your Trey workflows as an API in a secure manner and combine that with things like access policies and authentication wrapped around that as well. So some of you might already be familiar with the concept, if you like, of API management. And you might be thinking, you know, why Trey API management? And really the case here is that it's enabling your organization to modernize your API management capabilities by kind of fast tracking your API delivery, helping you sort of reduce that time and effort that it takes. And really that comes in, in three main areas. The first one is speed. And as you'll see in the, in the demo in just a moment, it's really quick to be able to convert a workflow that you've built using our low code builder into an API with just a few clicks. This also takes away a lot of that scalability headache that you have to worry about, so you can scale it up and down without any of the associated cost headaches. And also it gives you a lot of flexibility. So one of the really nice things is some out of the box capabilities, such as our policy engine that allows you to deploy APIs that kind of will suit your business needs. And we will delve a little bit deeper in some of the things that you can wrap around those API endpoints so that you can make sure that they do what you would like from a, from a business functionality side of things. So taking a look at some of the scenarios where you might use API management, these are just a, a few examples. There are, of course, a, a ton of different areas in which this could be leveraged. So the general idea here is that if you've got an underlying workflow or potentially set of workflows that you've built on Tray, you can expose those via a callable endpoint. And a really good starting point for that is potentially considering some of your existing webhook-based workflows that might easily be able to adopt some of the additional policies and restrictions that API management provides you kind of by default out of the box there. It's also really interesting when you start considering that it does unlock the capability for you to start leveraging more of a composable architecture as well. So you can sort of package your workflows into callable endpoints that you can use elsewhere. So for example, you might want to use that in another workspace so that people who are working in their own workspace on Tray have a simple endpoint that they can interact with in order to interact with that in different ways. And so a couple of really interesting example use cases, and like I mentioned before, these are just a small subset of the potential possibilities here. But for example, you might want to decide, actually, I want to present a simple REST interface for setups that natively do not support them um, in order to increase composability. So for example, you might be dealing with a really difficult, complex SOAP API, for example, and you don't necessarily want everybody to have to interact with that. So you might decide, actually, I want to expose that through a simple REST interface instead. 
Alternatively, you might want to have a simple single interface for quite a complex business process. So for example, if there is a process that you have around some of the systems that you're potentially creating data in, or any of the data the systems that you're interacting with on the platform, you might want to have a workflow that handles a lot of those policies and procedures built out by someone on your team, and then simply expose those workflows as a simple API endpoint that you can use from other areas of the platform, such as in another workspace, so that you can interact with those workflows under the hood. And it also is a really simple way for you to provide a simple interface to access the results of complex integrations. So with Trade Build, of course, the power there is that it gives you a lot of flexibility to sort of build out the integrations and automations that you need that match your use case exactly as you require. And so what's really powerful is being able to take those underlying workflows and now expose those with a simple single API interface as well. And so if we bring all of that together, it's really extending on that kind of ID that you're using, that trade build experience and providing you with the integration automation and also API management. So taking some of those underlying workflows and giving you a really simple interface to expose those with. And one of the things I mentioned at the start was that built-in policy management, so that policy engine wrapped around. And so this is designed to be really flexible and there's some cool things that you can do with this. So that's gonna be doing things like managing the authentication into that API endpoint, allowing you to do things like set rate limits. So for example, if you wanted to restrict the amount of time that someone can you know, send a request or send, restrict the amount of requests that could be sent to that endpoint, you can do that with those rate limits. You can restrict access by role. So perhaps some people don't have access to their, that API endpoint based on the role that's been assigned to them. You can enforce header policies. So there's a ton of headers information or a ton of information in the header of a request that you can make use of within the policies that you define here to again, define the level of access. You could do things like limit access by IP. So if you wanted to restrict or whitelist a set of IP addresses, that's possible. And also start to block abusive or suspicious behavior. And this is a really flexible policy management that you have that you can wrap around all of the actual API endpoints that you're deploying with this API management feature. So that's enough of me talking to some slides. Let me hand across to Joshua, who's now going to take you through a live demonstration of this functionality directly in the platform itself. So over to you, Joshua. Thank you, Luke. Um, give me one second. Okay, hopefully you are able to see my screen here. Uh, thank you for that introduction to the functionality of the API management. I'm excited to show this to you. Um, what you see here on my screen is my account in my personal workspace. Uh, this can be done in any particular workspace that you need because it's an API endpoint. It's accessible from anywhere. Um, I have already set up a basic project um, that contains one workflow uh, set up to uh, initially be a webhook trigger. This is going to change in the very near future to a specific API trigger. Uh, to totally block off the webhook endpoint. Um, so the webhook trigger then retrieves a set of um, contacts from our training connector, which is used in the, the Tray Academy, which if you have not yet seen or checked out the Tray Academy, highly recommended, lots of great information in there. Um, that uh, research basically retrieves for us a, a set of um, demo contacts dummy information so this workflow will then return the first of those contacts because we don't need that uh, many of them coming through um, once you have whatever endpoint or endpoints workflows that you need configured for your api then what happens is you go over to the operations section which uh, once enabled on your account you will see on the left uh, which you will see gives us a separate uh, base URL for this API. And we then have the operation to create operations. So uh, an operation is going to be you know, tied to a specific workflow. You can have multiple operations tied to the same uh, endpoint workflow or one uh, workflow per operation, depending on your specific needs. This is the one that we have available to us. And we're going to say get records. As the name of it. This is the friendly name. There's uh, also a uh, the actual path here, which will be get underscore records description uh, get first, and the method. Then we can specify which method we want to use for this. In this instance, it makes sense to use get, but you have the others as options. And then we will go ahead and specifically enable it. When I hit save. We have now configured and enabled a an endpoint that can be queried by 
something like a postman. So what we're going to do is copy this specific. This gives us the whole thing right there. And when I hit send to get it, I'm going to get unauthenticated. Why is that? By default, all of our uh, APIs are set up to require authentication. Uh, this can be turned off as a specific policy, uh, but uh, initially it's going to require uh, authentication. So how do we configure that? Uh, down here, as it says here at the top, access control is the option we want to go to. Access control is where we are able to define roles, policies, and clients. Um, I found in my own testing of this, and it makes sense to start with the role first because you want to think about um, how you want to configure um, different kinds of users for a particular use case. So say you have uh, internal users versus external users, or maybe you want to specify a role for a specific uh, customer, whatever that is. You have the ability to do so. So that role can be something like viewer, um, which is viewer. Once the role has been created, then that's available as one of the options in a policy. So the policies are specifically the rules that are going to affect how this uh, API uh, works. So we can create a policy. At the very top, we choose which uh, uh, operations this is uh, attached to. So as you build in additional operations, um, they will be listed here. Here's our first operation that we've created, which is get records. Uh, you also have the option of applying something, uh, these policies globally. Uh, so if you're going to do something like a global policy, you want to think about, you know, what uh, will apply to everything and not be more restrictive than is necessary if you are going to add additional policies at a later time to further uh, restrict what's uh, possible on here. So we will call this then the global policy. The policy rules uh, here have a lot of different options. So it, you'll see the note here that's saying unauthenticated requests are not allowed. We could actually say authentication false uh, as a policy rule, which would then not require authentication and allow anybody hitting that particular endpoint to get data, uh, which is not what we want to do here. So it is not necessary to say authentication must be uh, required because that is a default out of the box, as noted. So what we can do is say, I want to look at the role. Uh, is the role going to be viewer? Or if it uh, is not the viewer, depending on how that needs to be configured. Um, perhaps you want to add additional uh, validation, right? So you could look for a particular header field in addition to them being assigned to a rule uh, viewer. Um, JSON field refers to the different data that is coming in. If it is, for example, uh, an endpoint that is required, you're expecting data to be sent by the user in their payload, you can then inspect that payload for various values. This is how, for example, the content manager or content restriction uh, that was mentioned before, looking for certain words or disallowing certain words in uh, a body um, allows you to change how that's going to work. So that would be a separate policy from this global one here, right? Um, once you have defined what those rules are also, you can uh, mix and match these in groups. So uh, and a hierarchy, however complex that you need, of uh, alls and anys in, in groups. So if we say all here, so it needs to be a viewer and all of these rules. So the header has a, a particular value, et cetera. So there's a lot of flexibility and, and being able to be very specific about how this works. Uh, then the policy actions for this, uh, you have this global option of uh, accepting the request or rejecting the request. So you could specify these are the criteria that I'm looking for, and I want to reject the request when those are met. Um, otherwise, these are when I am allowing it. Uh, and then you have this optional uh, throttling, which can be in a couple different levels. So you can say, I want to throttle requests at you know five every minute, uh, but no more than maybe 20 every hour, something like that. Once you've defined what your policy uh, is going to be, and again, you can have as many policies as you need, uh, all the policies that potentially apply will be evaluated. So if you have a global policy and then you have additional, more specific policies, it's the, the summation of those that will be applied to whatever request is coming through. Then the last part here to get this, an actual authentication, uh, which is required, uh, is to set up a client. Uh, so the client then, 
allows you to get an API key for a particular user. Whether you assign this to only one singular user or a department or just use it internally for tray workflows to access this API is entirely up to you. Uh, but I will call this uh, user one. And then we now choose the role. And so since we've already set that up, again, you can have multiple roles. Uh, it is listed here. And then that uh, is now specified. So we are assigning the role user to this particular, the role to this particular user. Uh, and very important, when you hit save, you are presented with the API key for this user. This is the only time that you will see this API key, uh, the authentication token. Um, and you have no way to retrieve that after this one display. So make sure that you store it somewhere useful, uh, safe, uh, password manager, credential manager, et cetera, uh, because you cannot retrieve it. The only way you can get around that if you've lost it is to recreate the user. So I'm going to copy this to the clipboard. I'm going to go over to Postman and add myself uh, a bearer token under the uh, If you spell it correctly. Right. Typing is okay. There we go. Okay. Once that has then been added, say confirm. And now I should be able to hit send and getting a notification. One second. Make authorization. Also look at my workflow here and see if there's logging tapped here. There we go. So the day that authorization, not authentication, I uh, misspoke, but with the bear token, then we are able to see this. Now we can test out the uh, rate limiting by making that request a couple more times. Set it to five, but because this uh, training Salesforce connector is not instantaneous there's a little bit of a delay there uh, you can see though this uh, can be arranged in as many different workflows or as many different operations as you need so use cases that are useful if we for example want to look at the payload that is coming through um, we do have the path that's specified um, we have the whatever body or data that is being sent if that is part of it i have this set here so this would be something that could be checked as part of a policy is what this value is um, we have other information, uh, and also then this client ID. You'll notice this client ID here, uh, B6D90, is going to, I believe, correspond to our client BD, uh, B6D90. So if you have different behaviors based on the user, you have a couple different options on how that logic is, either by the client ID uh, or specifically what uh, particular path or operation that you have assigned for that um, user. So you could think about uh, having different operations and assigning them individually to different users for different use cases, et cetera. So a lot of flexibility there in how that is all set up. So uh, at this point, I think that concludes my demonstration. I'm going to hand it over to Tom to talk about uh, what's coming up. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Luke and Joshua. Great to see that in action. Um, let me just get my screen up. Yeah, so hopefully that was that was really useful. Again, what we've really kind of gone here is um, just uh, an experience that enables you to basically instantly expose any trade workflow uh, as an API endpoint whatever your use case might be. And that, that was the goal we kind of set out when we picked up this sort of functionality. So I'm going to sort of dive straight in because um, I know there's been a few questions and we'll come on to the questions, um, come on questions shortly um, around sort of availability when this is going to be available. So as, as, as some of you may have spotted, Joshua was using the new Trey UI there. Um, 
to to access the API management functionality. Now, some of the some of you have probably already uh, are already using the new Tray UI. Uh, this is actually in the process of being out, rolled out right now. When it comes initially, it will come with an opt-in feature. Um, and if you want to use the API management, um, you will need to be opted into the new Tray UI to be able to access that. Uh, it won't be available on the old Tray UI. So that's in the process of being rolled out right now. Um, it should be available to everyone within the next couple of weeks. Um, and if you haven't got it available and you'd like to jump on it, uh, just reach out and we'll get you enabled. Um, that can be done relatively quickly. Uh, so yeah, new UI to access API management. So the next kind of key step after that is just finishing off the initial API management release. Um, this will uh, include a specific API management trigger, uh, and this will essentially enable you to, um, as you, you might have seen there, de define schemas, uh, both input and output schema, um, so that you can uh, use the, the schema throughout the, the, the workflow to determine how the operation is, is used and how the API works. So that is coming with the initial version uh, and will be available at the moment, sort of early, sort of mid-April. Um, so, and, and that will be available to, to everyone once that launches. So that day is essentially mid-April. April management will be available to all customers um, and uh, you'll just need to be on the new UI to access it. So that's what's happening over the next couple of weeks. Now, off the back of that, what's going to be happening next shortly afterwards is the ability to generate open API spec um, off, off the back of the endpoints you build on Tray. Uh, and the application of that is obviously numerous. Um, you can then use them to, to build out developer portals, either internally or, or publicly facing, to, to, to kind of give access to the APIs that you build on Tray. Um, and off the back of that, we're actually looking at kind of a developer portal marketplace type offering. Uh, so that would be the idea to potentially... Um, Host uh, host your documentation directly on Tray, uh, and if you're interested in that, you know we're, we've got, we'll dive into that a little bit in a sec. But we're much certainly keen to to hear about any thoughts you might have on that. Um, so that's basically what's coming up next. Um, as we get into some of the questions, there's other things that are being considered. This is just a view of the things that are kind of definitely going to be happening. Some of the questions that have been asked uh, are definitely going, we're going to dive into some more of these areas because there are other things we're considering. Uh, they're just not sort of um, officially on the roadmap just yet but there's likely lots of stuff that's going to be coming soon. So we'll dive into that uh, once we get into the Q&A. So just diving into uh, specifically what we mean on each area. Um, so what's coming up relatively sort of, what will come as part of the initial release will be this new trigger here. You can see with its uh, swanky new icon, uh, the main sort of purpose of this trigger is again, being able to define those input um, and, or request response schemas so that you can handle the, the requests that come into the API and ultimately the response you get back to it and get that kind of certainty and map your tray outputs to those. Uh, so that will handle both sort of the success um, response, but also the, uh, the the failure response as well. Some of them are handed nat handled natively within the, the API management functionality, things like unauthorized is already handled, but you'll be able to apply specific specific uh, responses for particular fa for failure scenarios that you can build into your workflow. Uh, and then you can return those to your customers and then obviously then use them once we generate the API, once you have the ability to generate the open API spec to render essentially documentation. Again, I'm just using an example here of the swagger render of the, the open API spec. So that's coming, that's the sort of thing what's coming up next. Now, longer term, the idea is essentially building on top of this. And this is something we're actively exploring right now. And again, something we're really looking actually for um to, to hear from for, to hear from you, help our customers about, which is this idea of essentially hosting some kind of uh initially sort of internal sort of development marketplace within Tray, but potentially expanding to sort of the public sort of developer portal type offering. We essentially want it always to be a kind of one-click experience so you can make this available uh, and expose it to your internal users within just a couple of clicks once you've built the uh, the, the the composable APIs that you want to expose throughout Tray. So that's just an idea of what's coming next. Um, you know, uh, going to be available soon. Uh, and what's coming down the line? Again, let's dive into the Q&A now, I think. Um, and we can, yeah, go from there. And we'll probably cover up some of the topics that have, that have come up and, and touch on what's coming next when we go into that. Cool. All right. So, sounds good. So we've got quite a few questions that have come through. So uh, we appreciate everybody being active participants and asking all of these. Um, so we'll start with some of the more general questions. Uh, the first one, is this a, pay fee a paid feature? Um, how would it impact task usage if a customer is using the uh, universal automation cloud pricing? 
Yeah, great question. And I have to say, this is this, this feature will be available to all Trade customers once it is launched. There is not an additional fee attached to it. This is something that we really wanted to, with the you know with the launch of the UAC. We really wanted to to cover, and that's the Universal Automation Cloud uh, for anyone that was wondering what the acronym is we really wanted to kind of eliminate the, too much of this kind of real you know tricky kind of pricing the api platform will be available to everyone and the task that consumes with the apis uh, that are exposed through api management will just be um come out of your existing task allowance and any task cost you pay there so there's no additional fee to access api management all right um moving on to the next question um so who or where should we reach out to to have uh, the new UI and or API management enabled um, at this point in time, if we want to get our hands on it? Right. Yeah, that's a good question. So I think if there's if you just jump in the in the product channel and the community is the best bet I'd, I'd first recommend whoever your kind of account management contact is at trade give them a shout and they can get you they can fast track it to us get that enabled uh that's the new ui and api management as well um but if not just jump in one of the kind of the product channels in the slack community if you're active there and drop a note there and we can make sure you, you we get you the access turned on for you that's something we can do quite quickly so if you're keen to get started and get stuck in uh just let us know and we can get that done relatively quickly you may also have the option for enabling the new UI from within your trade profile. Um, you may have seen like a pop-up when you're logging into Trey um, and it says, you know, do you want to enable it or not? This is kind of a per user setting once it's available on your account. So. All right. Um, the next question I have, um, how does the launch of API management impact future CDK development? How does the sorry? I'll just repeat that. How does the launch very much In fact, see, um, I'm I'm not entirely sure that the 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 kind of the direct link um be, between the two. Um, obviously, any any connectors that are built using the CDK could obviously be used alongside API management within the within the kind of the the workflows uh, themselves, and then exposed through the API. So there isn't really a kind of direct link um between the two. Um. I think we are looking up from a CDK perspective, but you know, um, the stuff we're looking at right now is in, in enhancing our kind of the, the ability to deploy, share, and, and version trade connectors. Um, so, again, this is kind of a sort of centralized practice on how you know you 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 build and manage your assets and deploy your assets on Tray. So it comes under kind of that bracket to a degree, but there is no sort of direct link between the CDK and, and API management, but um, obviously any APIs you expose through um, um, API management could be used to build a connector with the CDK. If that's the kind of direction you're going, there's obviously nothing stopping you from, from doing that. It's something we've explored ourselves. And again, something that is further down the line is the ability to actually have a kind of more, it's like a one-click solution where you can expose a trade workflow directly as a connector. Um, again, leveraging parts of the CDK to, to achieve that. Yep. And Tom, there actually was a, a follow on from the person who asked it. So thank you, Patrick. Um, the question was more so, would you be able to develop that API management workflow with code um, for the setup and deployment, just like you do in the CDK? Uh, I see what you mean. So you can be able to develop the code around the API. Okay. I mean, um, let me just... Um, let's, um, Patrick, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, let's, I'll, re I'll reach out on the community. If you're active on the community and we can follow up there just to, so I can answer that properly and understand exactly what, what you mean there. Cool. Perfect. I'll reach out. All right. Sounds good. And then I've got one more, um, kind of general questions. So with the launch of API management, are there considerations to handle uh, multiple environments or DevOps? Yeah, so th this is something again. There's, I think, actually, the next workshop, and I'm going to be correct if I'm wrong here, is actually on um, SDLC uh, at Trey. And again, someone please jump in and correct me if I'm wrong there. But if you're keen, jump onto that one, get registered for that one because um, that's coming up probably sometime next month. Uh, yes, so essentially, we are, as I mentioned previously in the answer to the previous question, we're there's a big sort of push on SDLC at Trey, and that will include you know the ability to to manage and control deployments across environments. The initial launch um, won't uh, include API management uh, explicitly, but 
as, as, as with everything we've built right now, the consideration, the lens we're looking at is how do we include it as part of the SDLC offering so that essentially you could manage changes to your endpoints um, across environments and promote them from a, you know, a dev environment to a testing environment, then to potentially a production environment as well. So not immediately, but that is something that is being considered. Sounds great. Um, so moving on, we've got one question that is specific to embedded. So how does API management work with embedded, looking at it from the lens of using the same endpoint, but with customers' apps? Um, I was I was going to say, Joshua, do you want to jump in, potentially take yeah. that one? I know that's something you were exploring. Yeah, no, I mean, it's been a common request in working with customers who are using embedded to build solution instances about, you know, common workflows that may uh, be needed in each in multiple different solutions, for example, uh, whether it's internal data, that type of thing. And the way that it currently works is every every workflow that's part of a solution um, is are the only workflows that can be accessed by a solution instance. So it is entirely possible you could set up a, a workflow uh, with the API management uh, and create credentials, uh, and a user key for it, that is then used as a static credential in the solution um, so that every solution instance is using the same access token, uh, but then additional uh, information could be passed from the solution instance to the API uh, that would identify which specific customer it is so that you can, you know, adjust the answers depending on, on whatever logic you need uh, that would vary from customer to customer. So uh, I think that initially that's going to be uh, probably the most likely use case. Uh, it does not, I, it is not currently possible to put an API in a um, solution instance, uh, which I think makes sense uh, from a product perspective. Uh, but since they stand outside of solution instances, they would be accessible by solution instances. Um, and you know, other use cases that come to mind for embedded specifically are about like using tray on tray, where maybe you would set up an API for your own internal support team to uh, trigger a, a an API that then uses GraphQL to interact with solution instances to maybe you know update them or change their config value, uh, config slot values, et cetera. So. There's a lot of possibilities there that I think are very interesting and, and we'll meet some needs that uh, people have been asking about. All right. Um, the next set of questions I have are related to policies, tokens, uh, clients, and rate limiting. So we'll start with policies. Um, when we're creating policies, do we have an option to select more than one operation or do we have to create different policies for different operations? Um, I get Joshua, I think you touched on that in the demo. Do you want to take that one? Yeah, yeah. So once you have more than one policy and in that drop down or where you're choosing which operation to apply it to, you can check and uncheck those individually. So you can have a policy, you know, you can check global if you want global, or you can uncheck global and just choose whichever operations uh, you want it to apply to. Great. Um, moving on to the next one. This one is related to tokens. So is the token generation a one-time activity? And then a follow-on question, how do you recycle the token? Currently, it is a one-time activity. Yeah. Tom, I don't know if you want to talk more. Yeah, as you say, there's a couple on that theme as well, because I know I can see we've all, the, we've the a question around the, the TTL for the API token. So it's a one-time activity, and it's currently a long-life um, token. Um, so that that's with the initial launch, that would be the case. Things we're looking at quite, uh, which we're relatively fast forward again. They're not explicitly on the roadmap yet, right? Yet because we did right, right now because we're digging into them a little bit. But we're going to be wanting to expose this functionality via API. So the ability to basically create clients, policies, and roles via API, um, which would then enable um, a kind of you, know, you to configure a, a kind of token refresh sort of policy within Tray. Um, there is another question about supporting additional auth types. Again, right now, the initial version would just be token-based auths. Uh, so sorry, jumping ahead a bit here, Grant. We can come back to it if we don't cover it fully here. We're also exploring the addition of addition, additional auth types. I can see someone asked about certificate-based auth. Um, we're also looking at things like OAuth-based um, flows as well, where it makes sense. So 
if this is something you know if you if you're thinking you know api token good to get started but potentially want something where i can control like or refresh or um then we're really interested in hearing from you um and the the if you, if you give it just yeah um we, we'll we'll see the questions you ask we'll reach out to you on the community if you'd be happy to kind of talk through and help help us shape how we kind of handle laws going forward sounds great okay so we did hit a couple there i hope the folks that um, asked those original questions got their answers if you have any follow-ons feel free to drop them in and we can certainly circle back on them um, the next question i have up is related to rate limiting so do we see the rate limit status and the specific error if the throttling limit is reached? So I would say in the in the response. So no, right now the the, the I, I mentioned I think earlier that you know we handle some of the response error responses within the um just default API management interface. And one of those it, by default is the rate limits. We, we, what we do is we just return a, a 429 with a limit reached message, but we don't include information currently about the when 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 you'll be available to make calls again. But what we're looking at doing as part of the API management trigger will be to essentially enable you to override those default messages um, within the response so you could define a specific sort of rate limited response which you could return a 49 or whatever you want and then we could get, return a more kind of specific message um i think right now it probably would just be kind of influenced in the message um i think so we'd have to look into potentially exposing more you know context information like try again at x time or you know your rate will refresh at y time but that's not something you'll be able to do initially All right, and then the last one that's kind of in this grouping, um, can we create a client and assign it to a user in Tray so that it's only applicable in that user context? No, so at the moment, clients are essentially their own entity. Um, so they're not assigned directly to uh, a user at Tray or Tray user. So they're created a kind of a one-off sort of a single sort of entity basis. So they're not, yeah, so they're not directly linked to the Tray user, but they're obviously directly linked to the uh, the project that you're actually working in. All right. Um, I've got another one that has come up about rate limiting. So could rate limiting queue the requests instead of having them error out? I uh, say so more of a kind of sort of, yeah, a distinct queuing type mechanism. That's an interesting question. Again, like that, that is something that as you know, we ha I don't think we've considered just yet. I mean, again, I'm really interested in kind of like diving a bit more to kind of build out, um, you know, more of a kind of asynchronous type queuing interface to the endpoints. Um, that's just something that we actually you know, explored looking at kind of API, API management more general is becoming sort of more common through a REST-based interface. So we have seen some trends in that direction. Again, currently no immediate plans to do that, but I'd certainly be interested in hearing more about that use case. So um, probably expect a follow-up there from someone in the product team to, to understand a bit more. Because um, you know, developing queuing mechanisms on train in general is something we're also looking at. So even outside the context of API management, you know, the ability to essentially not just have a hard limit or hit into a concurrency limit and then just have, have an option to essentially queue high volume traffic is something we're exploring in general. So yeah, ex if, if you don't mind, we'll probably reach out and find out a bit more about the particular use case, um, if that's okay. Sounds great. Thank you, Ian, for asking that one. Mm. Um, one that is a little bit more general, more so maybe a best practice question. So when creating integrations, do you see a better practice to create API endpoints rather than using workflow endpoints. And the thought behind this is that it wants to use API management to filter headers or JSON in requests rather than use tasks in workflows to filter what's coming in. Absolutely, 100%. This would be a model use case, um, and again, something we 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 had in mind. You know, we know that sometimes you can you can have to build some stuff into workflows, which again, easy enough on the Tray platform, but adds to that kind of task count. So one of the things we thought, you know, in mind is by having that JSON field filter, you can build it into the API management interface and then drop a task um, from that, you know, from your workflow. You know, we, this is the whole, again, back to the UAC. This was a lot of the inspiration there. We don't want you, our customers to, to have to be paying for tasks that you don't, you, that, that you can be, that aren't necessarily that useful or are having, you're having to build in to kind of work around some limitations. So yeah, I'd absolutely recommend this to be the case. 
the policy engine for that purpose is designed to be as flexible as possible. So you can front load as much as you like to the the uh, the, you know, the 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 policy engine, and then continue to operate any additional more complex logic within the workflow itself. Something we actually are looking at as well is is a, going a bit further down the line is um, allow you to basically run another workflow as part of the policy evaluation. So again, not quite there yet. This is a bit more experimental, but essentially allow you to build in really kind of complex policy logic if you need to. Again, that's obviously going to come with additional task counts, but again, could be a way of managing that more effectively. So yeah, absolutely would recommend that as best practice. Great. Um, I've got another and a best practice related question. Um, are there any restrictions on how APIs created through Tray should be used? I mean, no, I, I, I guess I, you try to think off the top of my head if I'm trying to be, trying to say, yeah, go ahead, go go for everything. But no, I think that is the case. This is this is what we wanted. You know, we really wanted, uh, we know a lot of uh, a lot of people use the existing kind of webhook trigger functionality. We know we have the request response there. You know, so this, the ability to you know, essentially respond to an incoming request. And we know that's used extensively. And we'd expect exactly the same with this. You know, initially, um, we, we, there aren't any sort of restrictions I can think of, um, of of where and how this should be used if you want to expose you know, endpoint on tray. Uh, we're expecting, as Luke said earlier, both internal and external use cases, you know, be it within the company, uh, within your team, or outside to your customers. I mean, with the caveat of you do still have the execution time of the workflow that underpins your API, so it may not make sense for uh, use cases that are needing always very, very quick responses. So like, you know, loading all the assets for your front end application in a high traffic use case may not be the best way to use it currently, um, but that's a consideration as well. All right, and then I know we talked about different authentication methods and um, the fact that the team is looking at OAuth-based flows, Tom, as part of answering another question. Um, I didn't know, was there any other detail you wanted to give on other authentication methods, or do you think we've covered everything? I think we pretty covered, again, the next stage there is very much kind of researching and exploring, you know, what methods we should expose next. Um, so if you have raised a question about that and you don't mind, uh, and you're active in the Slack community, if you don't mind, we'll probably reach out to you um, just to kind of find out a bit more. Um, that'd be that'd be me or someone from the product team that'll be reaching out. Um, but just to call out that additional auth, auth support is is definitely something we're considering uh, to 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 build into this product. All right. Another best practice question: um, Are there any best practices from the team around creating paths, since it appears to be a manual process right now? And do those paths need to be aligned with any systems you interact with downstream in your workflow? Oh, Joshua, do you want to take that one initially? I mean, I, I think, again, you can, the typical REST pattern where you want to map a path to an operation makes sense uh, from at least the public facing aspect of the API. Whether or not you are choosing to map each individual operation to a different workflow or you want to handle, you know, add logic in a primary workflow that is evaluating that path, because the path is that was passed is part of the, the webhook trigger payload, uh, you can have branching logic based on what that is. So um, I think it makes sense to, you know, follow API best practices uh, so that it makes a lot of makes sense that way. But how you choose to wire it up on the, the back end with the workflows is up to you and your specific use case. Thanks, Joshua. Um, and then another embedded related question, maybe coming back to you, Joshua, uh, is it possible to use APIs created through API management to trigger tray APIs that will update existing solution instances? Uh, there's no reason it would not work. I uh, have worked with clients um, who are using exactly that, where they have a workflow in tray that is using GraphQL uh, connectors to interact with the, the tray GraphQL API to make changes to uh, various aspects of solution instances or you know recreating auths, all sorts of various use cases. So it would make sense that you could put an API front end on this and then enable your support team to just send a simple request to to make whatever changes and then they don't need access to the master token they don't need to even log into tray to help the customers uh, 
modify their solution instances depending on the functionality you want to build out for them. I, I can also think of use cases where you could do reporting or other get information about um, solution instances and so on through this API. Uh, it's just a matter of configuring it properly with the GraphQL on the in the workflow. All right, and that's great because we hit some example use cases for embedded there as well. Um, Joshua, any others that come to mind that maybe we haven't touched on? Um, I, I think that there are, you know, again, using tray on tray. So you could use a, a tray, an API endpoint that would give you information about the existing solution instances using some GraphQL in that workflow. Um, we have, I think, some examples about how you can use a workflow to iterate over all your solution instances and output that data to something like a Google sheet. Well, you could either use an API to trigger that process, or you could use an API to then retrieve the results, depending on the size of what that is. Um, other use cases are, you know, workflows that would be common across multiple different solutions um, that uh, do, you know, the same kind of thing, whether it's looking up standard data tables or, or other uh, internal information that you would have that may vary for your solution instances. Uh, that gives you one place to then manage those the workflows instead of having to make modifications in every version of that workflow in every solution that you have. So those are the ones that uh, most definitely come top of mind. All righty. Um, well, I think we've gotten through all of our questions. I know um, I certainly appreciate the active participation from the audience asking them. Um, you know, maybe we take Sorry, one last Brad, call. Quick one. I did. I think yeah. I know. So I don't think the, the, some. I think William, you asked about white labeling the endpoint URL to match application domains. This is again. Thanks for coming this out. This is something that is on our again something we're exploring as well. Um, to, to basically enable you to, yeah, to, con for, to fully control um, how these are exposed to, you know, either internally or externally. So yeah, something we're looking into, um, I don't have exact timelines just yet, but again, this is something that has been considered. Yep, and then Connor, I see a question coming in about Academy and um, API management. So it is something that we have on our roadmap for this year. It's not going to be available, you know, immediately when the API management feature is um, accessible within your instances of Trey, but it will come, I believe it's going to be uh, toward the end of the second quarter or the beginning of the third quarter of this year. All right, I think we are all set on the Q&A. Thanks again to everybody for being such an active audience. Yeah, thank you so much for those amazing questions. We really appreciate it. And I think, that's pretty much everything just with us to now kind of finally wrap up. Um, there's a QR code here, which I believe will give you a link to join our Slack community if you are not already. Is that correct? Absolutely. A good old QR code. If you scan that, you'll get access. Perfect. Well, in that case, I already teased some um, upcoming build workshops. I may have jumped ahead a bit there. So apologies, um, <laughs> education team, if I've, uh, if I've ruined some of the surprise there. But we've obviously got more of these coming up. Um, I think we've just got the poll popped up as well, the wrap-up poll. So if you could take some time to, to fill that out, that would be great. Um, but yeah, other than that, anything else uh, before we wrap up, Grant? Oh, sorry, I was muted. Um, I did wrap our uh, wrap up poll, so folks can take a look at that. And then I do want to put two links in the chat um, for folks who might not be in the community. You can go to this link and join there. And then I did mention Trey Academy as well when answering um, Connor's question. So Trey Academy is your one stop shop to learn anything and everything you want to learn about Trey in a fun and interactive way. So if you haven't checked it out yet, I strongly encourage it. Brilliant. Well, in that case, I'm gonna stop sharing now. Um, and again, just wanna thank, thank you very much for everyone that joined. Thank you everyone that's completed the polls throughout. Um, and obviously keep hitting us if you've got any questions. Um, have a great day.